today, I think it's appropriate that our last full session of the summer university discusses migration and populist politics because these are kind of the general framework themes that have been approached throughout the last two weeks. So we have a really wonderful panel of, of experts and practitioners here today to kind of not lead us to conclusions, probably, but to maybe um, open up questions, um, more questions and more approaches um, that we can take to contemporary migration. I just wanted to give a brief introduction. Um, Professor Skelly sent all of us, I think, today some articles. And I, um, one of them was good at kind of uh, summing up some of the major critical points of discussion when we're talking about migration today. So um, the conflicts that surround immigration often um, have more to do with race and identity and politics and they actually relate to surges at the borders because as we all have seen um, both in the United States and in Europe the actual numbers of people trying to seek refuge in, um, in the EU or in the US has dramatically declined over the past year or so. So the anger um, that we see on the parts of potential host populations often stems less from migration specifically than from a broader anxiety over social change. People are afraid of change. So for some people, this is explicitly racial, but for many others, the mere fact of cultural change itself can be unsettling. Um, immigration is just one of the changes that bring about a feeling of loss of control. So when asylum seekers arrive without permission or without warning, the mere fact of cultural change itself can be unsettling. And immigration is just one of the changes that bring about a feeling of, of loss of control. And this means that they have anxiety um, about the sense of borders and the inability of nations to protect their borders. So I think it's a very symbolic um, uh, kind of uh, prescription that the symbol of national identity, territorial borders and their protection seem weak and so people feel vulnerable. So on both sides of the Atlantic, migrants and asylum seekers have become for many voters a symbol of political failure to protect them and their interests. So efforts to solve unauthorized, so-called unauthorized um, border crossings have highlighted the central political contradiction. Um, American and uh, European Union law requires these entities to accept people for asylum no matter how many arrive. But the politics of migration demands some sort of limit on their numbers. So the only way to resolve that contradiction without violating law is by preventing people from arriving in the first place and then deterring them from setting out um, on their journeys in the first place. There is also a contradiction between the old ideas of national identity, which are rooted in fixed demographics, versus a modern world in which international migration is more possible than ever. So the policies intended to deter arrivals are more likely to do more harm to the migrants themselves and make it more difficult for them. And this is putting national structures and the EU itself at risk. So it is possible that the U.S. and the European Union could find immigration policies just palatable enough to forestall greater political breakdown, but that will not solve the underlying question of what place immigrants have in America and European societies, which has polarized our societies more than ever in the recent years. So as we move to the um, presentations today, we'll start with more 
global and, and um, kind of regional overviews of migration. And the first speaker today um, is Ishvan Kordva, who is the head of the Romanian Institute for Research on Minorities and a professor at the Babishvoyai um, University. He's a professor um, of, at the Hungarian Language Sociology and Social Work Department at Babes Boyai University in Cluj. So his main interests are sociology of race and ethnic relations, multilingualism and social cohesion and ethnic migration. So I thought that his more kind of global perspective would be a good entry point for the discussions today. So Professor Horvath, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay. I'm coming from a country where uh, uh, migration and refugees uh, are rather marginal on the agenda from Romania. Uh, however, we have enough populism centered around justice and the judiciary <coughs> system. Still, in such circumstances, I choose to speak more generally since I cannot present a kind of over. But speaking it more generally, uh, I will start to present the relationship between swan eating and populism. Of course, this was just a feeble attempt to make the joke at the beginning of the presentation, but however, it has to do, and I will advance my argument and then I will turn back to swan eating. My argument is very simple that uh, a populist, recent populist that arises uh, uh, in Central and Eastern and Southern Europe, it's not just simply related to the demographic stress produced by the recent flows of refugees, but it has to is determined by a more general context of what is called deglobalization. And I will try to present in this respect these arguments, but I will turn back to my swans here. Actually, this, uh, uh, this image, it is from a PhD thesis on uh, Polish immigrants, immigration in Great Britain. And it has to do with one urban legend of uh, uh, Eastern immigrants eating the swans. Uh, uh, from the lakes and parks, uh, city parks uh, in Great Britain. However, for me, this kind of urban legend was not new, a novelty, because I met this urban legend at you no know, 20 years ago when I started to study the context of reception of Romanian immigrants. Uh, 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 the immigration of Alfo started in the 90s, when even in Austria and even in Italy, this urban legend appeared that Romanian immigrants were so uncivilized that they have eaten the swans from the city park uh, uh, lake. However, I traced the uh, uh, origins uh, of this uh, urban legend, and through a funny turn of the history, this urban legend appeared in relation with the Italians who immigrated at the end of the 19th century uh, uh, to the United States, and they had eaten the swans from the Central Park, of course. <laughs> uh, 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 <coughs> what has to do this uh, uh, with, 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 with my argument? So let's turn back to these, this type of reaction of public opinion with the small eating uh, Italians. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a, a kind of uh, popular reaction to cultural change. We know very well that the context of reception of the Italian immigrants at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, was not rather sympathetic, uh, it was rather unsympathetic and generated heavy reactions on behalf of the United States public opinion, leading to a uh, restraint of the immigration. We know very well that starting from the, uh, from the 20s, the United States started to limit the entrance to be selective uh, uh, with the entrance uh, and to impose different types of quotas, regional quotas, etc., etc. What is here more interesting it is that in the, one of the core ideologies of uh, limiting these types and making these types of selectivity was the eugenetics. The, clean, the racial cleanness uh, of the people. So practically, we have a kind of uh, very clear uh, uh, idea of uh, uh, making, categorizing people and racially pure, racially impure, civilized, uncivilized, etc. So practically, we have here a kind of basic shape for, for populism. But we know very well populism is an identity-centered policy. It operates uh, with dichotomies, uh, morally very charged uh, uh, dichotomies that cannot be passed. So practically, this was a kind of populist uh, 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 reaction to this. However, populism and uh, 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 cutting back the migration in the United States was that phenomenon that was solely uh, 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 linked. Because uh, 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 scholars of globalization 
our argument being that this was only one aspect of the complex changes that occurred with the beginning of the uh, 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 First World War, uh, the 30s, and after that they called this process of debt globalization. Uh, only one aspect of the process was cutting back the migration. It was also different in different domains, uh, uh, like in economy, the flows uh, of the goods uh, were cut back seriously, uh, the flow of capital was severely cut back, and of course, we have an emergence of populist policies all over Europe. We know very well the whole context uh, of the between two world war policies uh, uh, in Europe. So practically, uh, the basic argument here, the first argument it is that uh, uh, the fear from migration, it is of course generated by large inflow of migrants. Of course, in literature of race and ethnic relation, we all know that what is called demographic stress, that people are fearing that immigrants will drastically change the uh, 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 underpinning values of their society. But however, this has to do also with the decisions of greater actors that instead uh, of uh, more uh, 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 more globalization, to cut the globalization to somehow limit different uh, aspects related to uh, globalization. So practically, uh, uh, these types of protectionist measures are very important. Then. So practically, this was the relationship between swans and uh, uh, migration. However, uh, this is a general argument for a general historical context. Uh, what I want to show here, if I'm succeeding this, that uh, in general, the deglobalization, it's, it has to do with, with what we can call periods of backlash, backlash that are producing political innovation with the intent of managing deglobalization. So practically, uh, what I want to, uh, my argument, what I want to point out, it is that uh, these types of reactions are not just uh, uh, the large flows of refugees in Europe are not just the opportunity context uh, for generating uh, uh, these types of popul emerging populism uh, in our region, but it has to do with the fact that uh, we are in a period of backslash uh, of globalization, and we are in the circumstances of different political, seeking for different political solutions, managing the globalization, uh, the different political actors who are weighting the uh, costs and benefits of globalization and considering themselves as losers or at least marginal uh, among those who are the winners of this globalization process. They are trying to advance different types of solutions to manage somehow the globalization. Not to cut down totally the globalization, but trying to invent new rules for uh, 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 interconnectivity. However, uh, with these new rules, one of their first reaction, of course, is the segmentation of the markets. Uh, it is the introduction of different limits uh, uh, for immigration. However, and uh, uh, what is happening here, I will just try to show you some data. Usually, economists and historians of globalization are argumenting that you have three types of indicators of the globalization. Uh, First of, all, first of all, it is about circulation of goods. So practically, uh, this is a kind of first argument that the circulation of goods starting with the economic crisis from 2008 uh, uh, slowed down, uh, uh, even if not seriously, and it shows some signs of recovering. However, which is very clear, that you have a clear sign of uh, uh, slowing down the increase of trade, of the global trade in general. On the other hand, if you are looking to the uh, export, and this is the, uh, of course, the direct exports, here it is the <coughs> foreign direct investments, uh, the dynamic of foreign direct investments, which also shows a kind of changing in the dynamic of pre-2008 and after 2008, so practical it is. However, here we are speaking about flows, uh, increasing flows or decreasing flows or however, changing flows of asylum seekers. However, the latest report on uh, the global migration strand uh, issued by OECD uh, shows very clearly that in terms of the global flows, we have also a decrease, a very sensitive decrease here, because if you look uh, uh, also either on the curves, either on the less data and the textual data, 
uh, between uh, uh, 95 and 2000, the global flow, the total global flow was 38 million, rising up to 2010 to 45.1 million, and for the 2010-2015 period, declined to 36.5 uh, uh, million persons. So practically, we are in a circumstance that, uh, that uh, uh, we, uh, we can uh, justifiably presume that uh, we are in a new context uh, of deglobalization. And these types of symptoms, these types of reaction of the different actors are about seeking forms of regulating somehow globalization, which means in, in, in every case uh, regulating globalization it means, of course, globalization. It is uh, a, its core a liberal ideology. It is about freedom of markets, uh, freedom of circulation of persons. And of course, it's basically these types of reactions are illiberal uh, uh, in their core. Usually, these types of reactions are uh, uh, making contradiction between global and national. And these types of new deglobalization is seeming, it's not just necessarily national, but a kind of regional. We are speaking about Central and Eastern Europe type of identity. Polish nationalists, when making uh, 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 their rallies, they were uh, fighting for a racially pure Europe. Europe will divide or will be uninhabited. Uh, uh, so practically, this, these claims were done in the name of Europe, or more restrainedly, and, and if you're thinking about last summit in Europe, we have a kind of, not necessarily just national level, we have also regional levels in which uh, global versus, let's say, Central Eastern uh, uh, European uh, uh, type of identities. These types of discussions, of course, are morally, uh, 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 working with morally opposite categories, with Christian Europe versus uh, Muslim, Muslimized Europe, uh, 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 with, uh, with racial arguments. So I think that the discourse is well known for you. I don't have to bring in more arguments. So practically, yes, please. Could you say, uh, HI countries and CG countries? Uh, high income countries uh -huh. and uh, uh, Sustained, uh, uh, sustained development countries. So it means SG countries, those who are not necessarily high income countries, but to reveal a sustained development. So practically, the economies are in growth economies. So practically, this is uh, the difference there. Uh, so turning back, uh, uh, the general deglobalizing type of discourse and politics and seeking for solutions in these circumstances, uh, Inf influx of uh, uh, refugees, it is not necessarily just a window of opportunity. It has to do with a more general sense of trying to regulate somehow the globalization, trying to impose new rules, trying to redefine these types of groups. Of course, it is an identity centered movement. It operates with this dichotomic category, with more morally charged opposite categories which, of course, uh, it is a kind of minimal definition of populism, what we are calling, that populism is an identity centered movement which operates with the, involves the interest of the people uh, uh, versus the uh, interest of the foreigners, etc., etc. So I think, and uh, uh, on, on my vision, uh, well, uh, this is the way how swans are arguments for what I was willing to present to you that the recent populism, the recent populism, uh, uh, the slow flow of refugees is not the, not the context or the cause which generated different types of populist politics. Uh, it is a, a surface which, of course, hardened these types of discourses or fueled these types of already emerging uh, uh, populism, which populism it is not just very particular regional, but this has to do with a kind of deglobalization process that I started to offer you here several arguments in this respect. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much for putting it yes. Um, for putting in the context of deglobalization because we haven't really approached it that way um, yet. Um, moving right ahead, because we have so many speakers today, I would like to introduce you to um, Miroslav Barna. He's the chairman of the Slovak Committee for UNESCO MOSH program, um, and a senior researcher at the Institute for Sociology at the Slovak Academy of Sciences. He's currently chairing the Scientific Council of the Institute and the Slovak Committee for the UNESCO MOSH program, 
oh, most, I should yeah, pronounce it, I'm hearing it. His research focuses on migration and quantitative comparative research. So he has a book, <coughs> Migration from Slovakia after accession to the European Union. And I think this, this, um, this uh, topic of uh, migration from East and Central Europe to Western Europe after, um, after the accession um, very much um, goes um, uh, in parallel with what we um, have just heard because we have not only immigration from the outside, let's say, of the European Union, but also a lot of internal migration, which has had, had, which has had dramatic impact on the countries from which um, migrants travel. So I would like to introduce you now to Miroslav Bama, and um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <coughs> uh, I was just thinking when I was asked to speak here, just giving some thoughts about the seemingly paradox of Central Europe being the part of Europe which is the most afraid of migrants, of incoming migration, at the same time being a region sending out people for work or living in West Europe. So I, as a migration scholar, when I started my academic years in, years in the academy in 2005, it was just a year after the accession of most of the Central Eastern European countries to the European Union, which was connected with, uh, with uh, which I've, I've, I've labeled as an unprecedented ex experiment in migration research, as you have like 10 countries simultaneously being given access to uh, labor, the labor market in the UK, in Sweden, in Ireland, without labor permits. So actually, just could come and, and start working there was unprecedented before in Europe. And actually, many use the opportunity. So, from the Central European perspective, the issue of migration much more silent was the help migration. What do we do with people? <coughs> okay. What do we do when we lose people? When, when people when people migrate? And then suddenly, in 2015, we have we have migration crisis, and we have the we for countries as those who are most say vocal in opposing uh, the the. European solution to, to, to kind of integrate and to, to help the other European countries in solving this problem. And at the same time, we have Brexit, another event which is also connected with migration from Central and Eastern Europe in the regard that actually, in part, at least in part, votes of the British voters who are connected with the fear of actually those who were coming in the country, particularly from Bulgaria and Romania at the time since, since the transition period just ended in 2004, so the timing for Brexit was very bad in this regard. So, so why, is, why, 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 do, why is migration feared and at the same time experienced in Central and Eastern Europe? Uh, uh, my, my explanation would be that the simply, simply motivations are, my motivations for out migration are according to, to comparing out migration from the countries, from the EU, 10 countries which joined the EU in 2010 were basically economically motivated. You have just, uh, you had 10 or 8 post communist countries which have widely divergent income, income, uh, income levels and basically you have almost no migration from Slovenia to the UK while you had a lot of migration from the Baltic countries, Slovakia or being somewhere in the middle. So, so the basic economic explanation would work. But why, why when, when a migration is seen as a thing that you actually uh, use when there's the opportunity, why is it feared at the same time when it kind of is directed towards your country, uh, which is not, not that surprising. But what's the difference between Central Europe and the Western Europe is, I would say, is the non-existence of the experience with the diversity in a positive sense. There has not, not, has not been the discourse of like having to integrate people from former colonia, which were our citizens and we are somehow entitled to join them into our society. Uh, the, the experience with diversity in Central and Eastern Europe was, was uh, just basically shaped by, by the Second World War and even before creating the nation states, and every state was happy to have. As, as much homogeneity within, within the country as, as there is possible. 
So, so this lack of experience with lack of positive experience with diversity would be what different uh, Central and Eastern countries uh, from Western Europe in this regard. And another thing that actually strikes strikes and that it differentiates uh, those who go out and those who come in and, and those who fear those who come in actually is. Which, which, will, which I will show in the figures. We've done, we, we've done a survey in 2015, so it was a few months after the climax of, of the, uh, the 2015 uh, migration crisis, and we have done we have asked several several questions on how why people should fear the migrants and, and if they really think they would also come to Slovakia, and the basic and we had just, just two factors which distinguish those who have more more fear. Uh, from those who have less fear, and the first and most important was age. So basically, the older people were those ones who were more afraid, while the younger ones were those ones who were less afraid. It was quite a notable, notable difference. And when we did the survey one year later, in October 2016, another thing became salient that actually is very much uh, connected with the actual political discourse on the issue and, and also on the feeling how, how pressuring the issue is since in 2016 the fear dropped significantly but what also interesting is, what's also interesting that even people whose well, most of the people asked said they do not fear or they do not think that migrants would like to come to Slovakia despite knowing this actually they expressed fear of migrants arriving in Europe, so you don't have to be kind of directly affected or think that you are directly affected, still you, still you fear that. And another uh, and this difference that we make also in the, in the next year, and another thing which actually stresses the importance of the discourse of how migration is tackled in the, in the media or by the politicians is that if we control all the variables, variables we have in the regression and we put being a member of the Hungarian minority in Slovakia, the members of the Hungarian minority, all factors that they could control for, they were more fearful of immigrants than actually the Slovak population in the country, which would also point towards like this force being more nature in the in, in the Hungarian media and the Hungarian politics, although it was obviously also used, also used by the Slovak Prime Minister uh, and other politicians at the time. So basically, that would be from from my part to discuss some issues further. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think it's an important, um, you know, uh, context that you know for the last thirty years, well, almost thirty years, about thirty years, there has been absolutely very little or no convergence in terms of economic inequality between the eastern part of Europe and the western part of Europe, even after the accession. And I think it's an, an important um, uh, aspect to remember as well that um, this region has, have, has had very little experience with migration. Uh, as, as was mentioned, um, there is no you know, history of colonialism in this part of the world. And whatever experience we have had of diversity here has not been a positive experience. Okay, let's move um, now maybe towards a kind of intersection with the, with uh, populism and populist discourse and it's politically um, manipulated. And we turn to Goran Gumza, who I think a lot of you met last weekend as he was here hosting in Slovenia and Maribor. Um, he is the Vice Dean of Research and International Project, um, currently working on the EU um, MATES, the radicalization of radicalized youth. And um, he cooperates in the creation of a study program on, on migration and integration, which is something that we would like to develop together. So his last field research was focused on labor migrants in European history, which has an important background for the contemporary experiences. Um, after studying the impact of migration on changes in social institutions, um, he says that the importance of cultural interchange in establishment and development of social institutions is of primary importance. And he sees that migrations as main protagonists of social development, bringing new ideas, views, and attitudes to a general social paradigm, but these have to be managed creatively. 
So I would like to turn to you now, Goran. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. I'm already introduced me, but uh, today I was uh, having the idea to focus on the Slovenian uh, example of uh, populist politics and reporting because we had a campaign for elections uh, recently and the migrations were used in a big say, um, as a tool of convincing the future voters either from the left wing or from the right wing parties. Um, it was very interesting to observe how the construct of migration and raising up the fear or convincing people that there is nothing to be afraid of was actually people reused in this campaign uh, unsuccessfully, I must say, because uh, that was by the end the marginal topic of the debate because the debate was constructed on attack on one particular politician in Slovenia. So everything was then at the end, by the end of the day turning around him and his opponent. But what was to be noticed that there are masses of people waiting just to cross the borders with Bosnia and Croatia in Velika Kladusha, around 100,000 people are waiting to be left or in Croatia. Uh, that Italy is actually preparing an exodus of the migrants, of all, let's say, illegal migrants, and that Italy will send them by the land to the neighbors, uh, and that Germany is exposing the migrants as well. Uh, so there was the idea that uh, everyone will then stop in Slovenia or ended up in Slovenia because Slovenia didn't close the borders yet. Uh, we have the border, Schengen border with Croatia, this is important to mention. Uh, and in 2015 the Schengen was actually, let's say, uh, faked with the migration path. Which it was obvious, either you start shooting on people to really implement the Schengen, or you let the people in, you know, and you just register them. Who are you? Yeah, Matt, 35 years old, born on 1st of January 19, I don't know what. And that was the idea. Of course, the Austrians in that particular uh, time, in 2015, they were not so naive because they knew that Austrian population is a little bit more conservative. So they said, let's double check the migrants and give the Austrians the impression that they are entering legally. So they double checked it after 20 kilometers on their border and they closed the border. It was really, actually it was, that was a mess because people were really waiting in between in the puffer zones uh, to be led first in Slovenia. You know, the Croatians, they were smart, so they didn't bring them to the border. They led them 10 kilometers before the border out from the vehicles, so just, you know, go that direction so that they wouldn't be responsible for no one, you know, bringing them to Slovenian border because otherwise we can return them to Croatia. And the Slovenians were just registering. And then the Austrians controlled, really, you know, just to make, to give the impression. But the Austrians, they positioned the army on their border and everything was actually, looked like a war zone. And this particular schema of political populism is being implemented at the moment. We know that Germany decided to close, to implement the border between Austria and Germany or to close the borders. And so the Austrians are now trying to convince the population, Austrian population, that nobody is closing or you know, the Austria. And they said, okay, we will now again raise the control on the Slovenian border because these 100,000 people from Bosnia are waiting to come and the Italians are waiting to come, you know. And the only not controlled border between Italy and the rest of Europe is the Slovenian border because the Austrians already controlling the border. The Swiss is not part of the European Union and the French, they are implementing the control as well. So the idea is that everyone will go through Slovenia or in Slovenia. And now you see, uh, I haven't seen anyone coming, I must tell you. Yeah. <laughs> At the moment, I am looking very well. You know, if somebody will pass my house, uh, the masses will start moving. Um, it is actually really a political populistic construct uh, to, you know, control the nation. Uh, and now, the right wingish um, <clears throat> paroles and the discourse was actually 
really not connected, not consistent, because first they were talking about closing the border with Croatia, you know, securing Schengen, and then in the same day, you know, giving the idea that we should move the Schengen border to Croatian-Bosnian border, and that we should help Croatians now to control the borders and close the Bosnia and Herzegovina being an enclave. And uh, what was then obvious in the debates of regular people, because as an anthropologist, I also then uh, mix myself into the debates, we call it bar debates, you know, and people were actually buying these ideas. They wouldn't believe, no. And there was, I have to vote for that one because this one will finally, you know, put the wire, the fence like Orban did, and, you know, finally secure the border, put the army, you know, make it strong, you know, make it, make the Europe, make Europe a fortress. But we know that uh, it's very difficult to uh, push the attacks as they are seen away. Either you start really aggressive with the violence, or you should think about the ideas how to uh, form or establish a society that will actually uh, not see the migration as a problem. Uh, and, okay, this is my idea. We shouldn't even discuss about migration as such. It's a normal movement from one place to another. Uh, where I have to mention the Slovene migrations, which are not mentioned in the media. Uh, Slovenes are actually daily migrants to Austria. We have more than 50,000 people living next to border who are working in Austria every day. So they are searching for job in Austria. They are migrants. Nobody talks about them. I was doing my field research in the car industry for six months, working on the assembly line, you know, and really talking and speaking to those people. Of course, there are many Turkish migrants and there are many, let's say, African migrants working in the car industry, but Willingly, Slovenes coming every day and going back. So obviously, Slovene policy or Slovenes or nobody uh, doesn't see that as a migration. But it is. It's a sort of migration. Right? Uh, unharmful migration, obviously. Right? And that, that was obvious that you should not you know, make categories out of migration. You should not say, okay, this is the... Uh, uh, Azov seeker because he came from the war zone, uh, this one is coming because of economic reasons, that is the climate change is migrant, I don't know. By the end of the day everyone is moving because it has to survive in the economical uh, sense these days because we are dependent on money, uh, on earnings, we are not dependent only on soil and agriculture. So uh, people are moving and if you don't see that as uh, immigration, ex-migration, migration per se, uh, then you see this as uh, gathering and bringing people together for different interests or for common interests. Uh, if we have a common interest of, let's say, economical development, we will come together uh, regardlessly to our culture, you know, origin, whatever, and we will not see each other as migrants. We will see each other as uh, co-workers, as partners. Uh, it's very easy to apply for a project, for example. You go and you search for your partners, you build up a consortium, and this is not seen as migration to the project. But actually, in this, uh, let's say, uh, very, very uh, symbolical sense, it is a migration, because the idea migrates to the common project into the European Union, for example, if it's founded by European Union, or into the ministry in the particular country. But it's the migration of the idea. And uh, yeah, these false categories and bringing up the identities now on the regional level, what we heard, you know, and this is very interesting. You, know, it, you don't talk about national level of, uh, of identity. No, it's a regional visual group. So in our campaign, there were questions from the uh, journalists directed to the politician, to the candidates, to whom will you turn? To Visegrad group or will you look to the Brussels or will you seek for uh, support in uh, Russia, you know? And that is difficult to answer. And it was direct, you know, boom, which identity will you choose? Right? Regional identity, Russian regional identity, you know, or where you go to Visegrad group, which is uh, somehow resisting the Brussels ideas, huh? or will you cooperate with Brussels? Yeah, but Brussels is actually European Union, so what are we talking about? <laughs> it was really, really difficult. But you could see this discourse, populist discourse, always bring migration on the front. And they're not a problem at all. You know, in Slovenia, I can tell you we have so little problems with migration. We have more problems with resisting the
the migration. Because if you want to, let's say, help children who came along, you know, position children in a, in a, a hotel or in a dorm or uh, somewhere in a small village, you will, you will inform the local resistance of population, you know. You're, you're not bringing me those potentially dangerous people to my environment. You know? Because these are kids, they will grow up and they will be a terrorist. It's a link again. Terrorism, migration. I don't know why, but this is a construct. Uh, so every migrant is a potential terrorist, regardless from when he comes. Uh, only think, okay, the Chinese are excluded because they eat swamps as well in Slovenia, believe me. And, uh, and also the Albanians are excluded who already ate all the swamps. But this is not, I'm not joking. This was, this was a good example. I started laughing because in Maribor we have, rest, we have uh, restaurants, like uh, grill restaurants, who are owned by Albanians. And then people were you know, really speaking to already 15 years ago, look, the swamps are disappearing, probably those Albanians are serving them on the plate, and the Chinese, they are, uh, per se, you know, they're eating everything. So uh, it's not uh, a Peking or Beijing duck that you're eating, but it's a draw swam that you're eating. So, uh, so that was interesting. <laughs> um, but as I mentioned, by the end of the day, the migration was used through the whole campaign, but it was not important in decisions. Right? So I think that people are not buying anymore these fake populistic ideas because they see, okay, it is true, already for three years we are talking about the flow of migrants. In Libya, there are, I don't know how many million waiting. Orban is, uh, Orban, uh, Erdogan is uh, holding back five million, I think. Holding back how? You know, in some moment he will send them to Europe or what? And what if they will not uh, be willing to go? So people push them with arms. Or, I don't know. So it's obviously a policy. It's politics. You know? It's a play of power. You know? And uh, today with Lena, we at uh, breakfast, we were thinking, discussing, and he said that uh, multiculti is not a solution. The solution is bringing cultures together if you want to make a synergies. You know? And multiculti, I see as a uh, 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 Migration uh, in savanna where animals are migrating to the water, and you know you have a dry season, and by the end of dry season there is really there are really small ponds of water, and who is coming to that pond? Lions, antelopes, zebras, everyone is coming. The enemies, and of course they are coming with fear, but they know they have to survive. So it's we have to be focused on that. That people are fierce from both sides, because we are coming to the same source of money, of economical prosperity, but not trusting each other, because we know that someone is from somewhere. And we have this concern that some people are more dangerous than the other, so they're the predators, or the prey, and everyone is actually feeling how he is, or she is. And this would be, you know, how to drink water from the same pond, not killing each other. This would be a good solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, you, see, you brought up so many important topics, and this, you know, this distinction uh, and lack of clarity on definitions of who is a refugee, who is an asylum seeker, and who is an economic migrant. I mean, you know, it, it, immediately in our in our minds, we think of economic migrants as somehow less deserving of our attention and our um, generosity than someone who is coming as a refugee. But we have put everybody into the same kind of categories now that that's coming and you know in Hungary we don't have anybody in Hungary on the panel here so maybe when we open it for discussion we can we can include Hungary but we you don't see any any um, immigrants refugees or asylum seekers here and yet that discourse is leveraged by um, by the government to create fear so that they can maintain their kind of you know uh, uh, monopoly on the power structure here but you don't see any you don't see any immigrants around in Hungary as well um, okay Thank you very much. So now we are going to um, move to Marco Zopi, who is a research assistant at the University of Bologna. And uh, one of the reasons we um, invited him here um, was because um, the University of Bologna has some very interesting and innovative uh, 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 research projects dealing with um, migration. Um, Marco Zopi um, holds a PhD in Histories and Dynamics of Globalization from Roskilde University in Denmark, and his doctoral work has analyzed 
on the process of integration of the Somali diaspora in Scandinavian countries. I think that would be very an interesting you know, uh, lesson for us here. Um, he currently coordinates the international research project called Territorial and Urban Potentials Connected to Migration and Refugee Flows. <coughs> so I would very much like to uh, welcome you and uh, yes. please. Thank you, first of all, for the kind invitation to participate in this panel. And thanks also to the previous speakers because they have all touched on points that are actually part of, of the focus I'm also um, applying here and that can be useful to put into the framework of socio-economic and political dynamics also that uh, I will briefly touch on. Uh, the project that I will present is mainly based... Yes. The, the project that I will present is based on especially data uh, about migration dynamics in two uh, regions, the Adriatic Union and the Danubian regions, but also in some respect will show data for the entire European Union. And um, as I said, um, we are familiar with some of the issues that have been already uh, mentioned before. Uh, we know that migration has gained uh, space in the political debate at the European level and also in the, at the national level in the last uh, few years. And um, we also know that the migration debate took place within already a thorny context where the European Union was facing uh, the struggle with Russia over Crimea. It was facing also the post-financial crisis tensions within the Eurozone. You can think of the creditor and the debtor and states within the, the, the European Union, the tensions that, uh, that follow, and also, of course, the Brexit. So these were all issues that create already a, a sort of a tension within the, the European Union and after that and migration built also on these, on these tensions. And um, I think what this project that I will present uh, does to the, to the debate of, of today is to present also another phase of migration because <coughs> the notion of migration is today associated with the idea of uh, having too many people of overpopulated areas or all the people wanted to come. But actually, if you look at migration dynamics, we also see a lot of territories actually lacking people, so to put it very uh, directly, meaning that we have depopulating territories, we have aging population. This um, is very true for rural areas in particular. So we are trying also to present data to show the other side, because migration can actually be the point of departure of a new debate in Europe about Europe especially in terms of territorial cohesion, avoiding further disparities between territories, precisely also on these demographic questions that are of course linked to services, to economic opportunities. So instead of having too many, we should implement a narrative of what we are lacking. So we are lacking services because we are not too many people living in rural areas. We are lacking infrastructures, and I think it was mentioned the idea of those at the margins of globalization, I think, was in the first <coughs> contribution. So we have to implement this kind of discourse to change the, the, the narrative also in terms of what we are lacking and what is the future of Europe in this sense. So, um, and also the lack of control that was mentioned, I think, is also very important. And so there is a problem with policy space. So I'll try to move a little bit into the project. Uh, you can see the title, you can see that the University of Bologna has been the, the leading partner. We have also other partners in, in Italy, in Greece and Albania that have helped us uh, find the data and construct the, the, the record and the project that is due uh, next week actually, so we are approaching the end of it. And uh, our stakeholders, those interested in the results, are mainly uh, managing authorities, so public authorities that have to in a way or the other, deal with some of the questions. So, um, I would say a few things about the projects. We have several interscopes scopes that we can underline. The main thing is a comparative analysis of migration flows. Here it's important to, to specify that we are used to talk especially about asylum seekers and economic migrants. What uh, we are trying to do here is also to show how intense is the migration within each country and also between countries of these two macro regions, the Adriatic Union and the Danube region. And uh, as I think you said, migration is normal when we look at the data for these movements. And, uh, and especially these numbers are 
rather higher compared to the asylum seekers and so forth. So the first idea with the comparing is to provide a picture of what, kind of, what kinds of migration are, are taking place in this area. So we have internal migration in each country, we have migration within, between countries, sorry, of the macro regions, then we have asylum seekers in irregular migration and so forth, and then we also have to consider those whose request has been rejected. What happens to the asylum seekers that are not being uh, approved in their, their international protection? But where do they go? How do they make their choices? These are all relevant policy uh, questions to be asked. Part of the project is also about mapping territorial technologies, understanding what territories are more attractive to all the kinds of migrants compared to others, and what we can do to improve the situation. And, and of course, policy recommendations that uh, we will uh, give to uh, the European Commission and to the managing authorities and also to, to local communities. And um, besides quantitative data, we are also implementing eight case studies. Um, I will not go into details here, but the main idea was to provide uh, understandings from urban centers, so you can see some of the cities there, to border areas, they also play an important role in managing migration and uh, urban, uh, sorry, rural context, which is also very important to get a different perspective of how um, migration affects territories. And we have interviewed NGO workers, we have interviewed uh, public authorities, uh, researchers, and so forth for each case study. And uh, the project is financed by ESPON, that is uh, an observatory that uh, aims at producing uh, cartographic evidence, especially to the European Commission, to all the actors involved in territorial cohesion. So uh, this is a Eurostat map, and I think it, it gives a, a first uh, look into the issues that we are facing. This is a, a net migration balance, meaning that the difference between those who move out and those who move in, in each territory that you can see on the map. And of course, the blue color is associated with people moving in. So you can already see a number of things, where there are the blue areas in Europe, where there are the different uh, shade of orange colors that tells you where people are moving out. And also, you can see some issues with data for some countries, Bosnia, Serbia, we don't have the same territorial uh, focus. This is also the problem of the lack of data that I think is important when we discuss migration, when we discuss populism, and I will mention a few things about that later. So now we'll show some of the maps that we have produced so far. The first kind of uh, migration dynamic is the internal migration. When I say internal migration, it means the changes of residence that are officially reported to the authorities. That already tells you that we don't know about those who didn't report that the residence change, and we can presume it's a big number too. So it's important to take this into mind. And that's the, the picture uh, for 2015, for example, those, those countries where we actually found data. Not all the countries provide this kind of information indeed. And um, you can recognize some patterns. We have definitely the, the from south to north pattern that is in Italy, which is very typical. Everyone who is uh, knowledgeable about Italy will know about these dynamics that have been going on forever. We have also some dynamics from the east to west in Croatia, so moving to the coastal areas, and one could make the connection with the economic opportunities and, uh, and so forth. One can also notice the centripet centripetal tendency, meaning the people moving especially to the capital or large cities in each of these countries. You can definitely see this in Albania, Kosovo, Hungary, and Serbia and Slovakia, for example, where, of course, the green color tells you where the people are moving in, right? And when the, the red color in different shades tells you where people are moving, changing in deregistering their residence. And then we have countries that are also a bit uh, mixed, meaning that they have different areas that are gaining population, not just the capital city. And this will be Bulgaria, Romania, for example, that you can definitely see the case of Romania, I think, um, is very telling in the northern part with the green colors. And I'm just moving to the 2016, what we can see is just a slight a worsening of the conditions, meaning that more reds are going red, and uh, only a few other uh, green colors are showing up in the territories. And uh, we put together this with the, the urbanization trend. So with census data, we, we put together the major, the capitals and some of the major cities to see that basically all these cities are uh, attracting new residents in, in the space from one census to the last information in 2015. 
So this is the general picture of internal uh, migration in the countries. A few other information that I can provide just for, for reference reference here about internal migration. We, we found almost two million and a half changes of res residence in the macro regions that provide data for it, which one can compare with the, with the asylum seekers, for example, in those years, and they would be very limited, 200,000, 280,000 uh, would be the, 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 the total, just to have a reference here. And of course, the, the, the young are the one most inclined to move, you can see, especially 25 to 29, and women in some countries uh, move way more than the men, although in some countries it's always looking as it's not really uh, evident. Now, a few information about the second uh, migration dynamics, which is movement <coughs> within uh, the macro regions. Here, we unfortunately, Eurostat and national statistical offices do not provide uh, much data about this movement. It's something that we really point out in the policy recommendations. So actually, we are trying to provide this map only for Italy, Croatia, and Slovenia, and Slovakia. The other countries do not provide enough data to, to present these maps. I think what is interesting here is that we see the changes of residence according to where these people lived before in the period 2008-2015. So the size of the pie tells you how many, and the colors will tell you how many in every two years. And what we see here is basically one million changes of residence all in a single map of people that moved from, to Italy from one of these countries. And for Italy, the case are uh, Romania is the first country of previous residents followed by Albania and then uh, Moldova. And in the case of Slovenia, for Italy it's one million changes of residence. For Slovenia we have 100,000 and for Croatia 60,000. So again, the, the intensity of migration uh, flows without considering asylum series, but <coughs> people that move for family reasons, for economic opportunity reasons, is already very intense. And of course we can put this information in a framework. I'm not going to, to go into details here, but if you are familiar with migration dynamics in these areas, we will recognize the importance of circular migration, brain drain from one area to the other, especially towards uh, Central and uh, Northern Europe, return migration, and of course we have to take into mind economic disparities, unemployment and so forth. So I'm not going to, to dig into these questions, but these are all relevant to the political level. Uh, a bit of information about the asylum seekers now. Uh, I will show three or four maps that just show you on, on a map what, what, what is the origin of the countries of, of asylum seekers that in the period of 2015-17 uh, applied for us asylum in the, in the following countries. So we start with Greece and you can see the red balloon which tells you how many again and uh, you can see what their origin countries in grey color. Uh, I think we have Hungary afterwards, yes, you can see uh, the different patterns of country. You can see how the picture becomes bigger with, uh, with Italy and then we move to the overall EU28 uh, context. These are just uh, cartographic evidence of information that of course are, are available uh, in many ways, but just to give you a direct uh, overview or a comparison of the phenomena. Here is a, it's a zoom on the first asylum uh, seekers in this, this period. Germany is 1,300,000, so it's in the, in the first as the country of, of most uh, applications received, 2015-17, followed by Italy, France, and Hungary in the fourth position, and you can see with the, with the balloons. And a few more data, I think um, here are those who applied for the first time. And uh, you can see on the left side four countries that got together the 90% of applications. It's important to stress the difference. So on the one hand, you see the 90% of all the applications. You can see how Hungary become um, exposed to migration flows in 2015. This is the blue color that became very important when compared to the, to the other three countries. On the right side, you have the remaining 10% of all the applications uh, distributed in the, in the way that you can see with Serbia and Kosovo aggregate data in the first position and the other. It give, this again gives a perspective also when you put this in comparison with this map about where people are, are not willing to stay or where the, the policies of integration and asylum are probably have more uh, issues to, to be applied, so to speak. So we see all the Western Balkans not capable, capable or not receiving applications. I can skip this one. And 
just a, a brief zoom before I conclude on the on the Western Balkan situation because a 15 percent of the Balkan route flows were also participated by uh, Western Balkan citizens. So we also applied a focus to a, a closer look uh, of how it looks like actually. So first of all, we see that they participated, meaning that there is a peak between 2014 and 15. So they joined the Balkan route. And we also see on the right side that projection rates of the uh, asylum request were very high, sometimes 100%. That means that they were considering a safe origin country, they were considering economic migrants. And uh, there are more information, maybe if, if you have questions I can tell you a bit more about also the Western Balkans. Just a brief look at the, the recommendations that uh, we are formulating uh, at the moment. The uh, first thing is about the data gaps. We are talking about migration, but we honestly lack a lot of data. We don't know about the skills, we don't know what they, they could do, what they are willing to do, what the product they can learn, and we also don't know what are the territorial needs in Europe. Some of the case studies underline that there are some uh, labor gaps that can be filled with appropriate acknowledgement of these gaps and uh, following policies, for example, training activities targeted on the sector. For example, in Italy we, have, we found that um, the maintenance of forestry or soil is very important. A few Italians are willing to do these kind of jobs, while a lot of uh, immigrants from the Balkan areas especially they have expertise in these fields and over the years, they have established more and more enterprises. They moved from being employed to be the owner of these enterprises, performing these kind of activities that are badly needed in terms of combating hydrogeological risk and so forth. While indirectly, they contribute to solving aging population issues, lack of services, and so forth. So some of the recommendations are about these gaps that we are still facing. Digitalization of procedures will give us more data again about the residents. And uh, deliberately, democracy can be very useful to, to present the case of welcoming uh, asylum seekers in a local context, especially. It was mentioned, I think, in one of the last uh, presentations, maybe yours, the problem of having asylum seekers in local <coughs> communities where they are not accepted, for example. So we need to improve that part. And uh, of course, the eight case studies, I mean, the, the recommendations from case studies are very similar. Lack of data and uh, transport digital communication infrastructures. So again, uh, territorial cohesion, what the, territor the territories need. This is important to put in the picture when we talk about migration and populism, because this can be measured. I mean, the message we get with the voting is focused on migration, but we actually start from some of these social problems on the territories. It's important to have this link also in mind. So, briefly, <coughs> we have seen that mobility is very intense and very dynamic in the areas. I'll show you the different kinds of migration flows. Uh, there is a growing urbanization while we are facing problems of depopulation in many territories, all these territories in red colors. And uh, these are also challenges of territorial cohesion, not just migration as such or populism as such. And we have to move, because it still has not happened, from emergency to long-term management and understanding of problems. It's so always important to re-emphasize this point. And the lack of data, which is, doesn't play any minor role in this discussion. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for a very informative um, presentation. Um, I think it was important, what well, you said also at the beginning, that this migration crisis is, is a crisis actually of management that reveals the internal conflict within the European Union itself. And, um, and, uh, uh, and your conclusion is that we ha don't have any, any long-term vision about how we can manage this property. And so we are only thinking in, in the terms of crisis management and, and don't understand you know, that we have to look at this at a long term because migration is going to be with us eternally. Um, I think this is a really great panel because we have heard from, so far from Slovakia, Italy, Slovenia, and now I, I'm very happy that we have um, Elena Alexinkova because, um, from Russia because, um, you know, Russia has a, a vast experience with migration and we, we seem to um, kind of leave Russia out of the picture when we talk about migration flows. So I'm very happy to welcome Alina Alexinkova here. She is the program manager for Russian International Affairs Council. 
um, in Moscow, and she coordinates research on, uh, on several different projects, which include pol political and economic dynamics in Central Asia, Eurasian integration, international migration processes, and she has organized um, three conferences on the migration issue at um, the Russian International Affairs Council. This is a topic that she also does research and publishes on. So, Alina, very much welcome to you. So, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for inviting me here. This is a big honor, really, for me. And uh, this is a big pleasure also for me to be here in this wonderful city, to do this university. Uh, so, um, I will uh, give you uh, a look on Russia's experience in managing migration flows. Russia is one of the main destinations for migrants on Eurasia space. And uh, uh, the period uh, that followed the dissolution of, so uh, of the Soviet Union proved to be challenging for Russia in terms of demographic and depopulation tendencies. Uh, declining and aging of the population uh, were partially compensated by an influx of migrants from the post-Soviet uh, space and uh, the visa-free travel regime was introduced for uh, the representatives of these countries and this was a really very human uh, approach to, uh, to this uh, post-Soviet space because the uh, country in new borders has artificially separated families, relatives and compatriots uh, who had lived in, uh, in one country actually uh, for centuries and generations. And uh, uh, since 90s up till now, uh, the total volume of the population in Russia has been 13 million people. Uh, this drop was almost compensated by migrants coming from USSR members. Uh, it was uh, 9.3 million people. Uh, but the tendency of the population is still relevant for Russia, uh, despite some positive trends uh, of birth rate in previous years. Uh, according to statistics, during uh, 2017, there were less, uh, there were 10 percent less uh, children born in Russia than in 2016. And according to latest researchers, uh, they focused uh, the loss of uh, 12 million uh, people by 2013. Uh, so, uh, today more than two-thirds of migrants coming to Russia are coming from the former USSR members. Um, but uh, in comparison with the 90s, uh, the characteristics of this migration flows to Russia have changed a lot. Um, so, uh, the flow of ethnically Russians or so-called compatriots is almost exhausted. Uh, those Russians who still live in the countries, in, post -Soviet, in other post-Soviet countries, are highly unlikely to come to Russia because they are already well integrated into the, those societies and have no intention to come back. Um, launched in uh, 2007, the state program of resettlement uh, of compatriots uh, helped to come back to <coughs> Russia just 656,000 people. Uh, according to International Organization uh, of Migration uh, and their statistics, uh, there is a potential of coming back um, between uh, 5 and 10 million compatriots, but the probability of their return is really, really very low. Uh, so, uh, the biggest part of migrants' flow to Russia today is labor migration and economic migration. Uh, the flow from Ukraine and Moldova is reducing at the moment because they have visa-free regime with the European Union and uh, the flows are already wetting. Uh, the reduction of flow from Belarus is also caused by the same demographic trends as in Russia, uh, declining and aging of the population. So in long-term perspective, there is no potential for uh, growing migration flows from uh, these countries, Ukraine, Moldova and Belarus. At the moment, uh, these flows are sub, uh, substituted uh, by the migrants coming from Central Asia countries. First of all, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, the uh, creation of Eurasian Economic Union, uh, one of the aims of, uh, of this union is to provide a common uh, labor space and common uh, labor market inside the union. 
and uh, uh, many uh, citizens of Kyrgyzstan are happy to have uh, these advantages to, to have um, uh, more uh, capabilities to work on the common labor market. So, um, the, uh, it is hardly possible to deny the importance for Central Asian countries uh, to, um, to have a possibility to send migrants to Russia because uh, it's very important for their development because uh, the uh, total volume of remittances that migrants send back home uh, is really very huge. It's uh, about 50% of GDP for Tajikistan. 30% of GDP for Kyrgyzstan, so it's really a lot. Uh, so, uh, migration, uh, uh, migration policy of Russia uh, is facing uh, nowadays some strategic challenges. First challenge is uh, the, as I've said uh, already, this is the compensation of nature, uh, natural population decline by stimulating migration from abroad and stabilizing the size of countries' permanent population. We understand at the moment that no country is uh, going to develop uh, in the condition of uh, declining of its population. Uh, the second uh, strategic purpose is to fulfill labor market's demand for additional workers against the backdrop uh, of national labor resources by attracting temporary in uh, international labor migrants. Third strategic uh, goal is changing the current migration vectors within Russia uh, because we have depopulated Far East and Siberia and uh, populated uh, uh, western part of the country and uh, these disbalances, uh, uh, the, the government is trying to somehow to compensate these disbalances with the uh, migration at the moment. So, uh, the state migration concept introduced in um, 2012, uh, it officially uh, aimed uh, to make use of positive potential of migration processes. So, uh, it uh, really states that migration has a positive influence on our economy, but at the same time, um, the uh, implementation of uh, migration laws and the whole atmosphere in Russia uh, is rather restrictive to uh, migrants and uh, we still, uh, and this migration policy concept still has no answer to the important questions such as what is the desired scale of migration? What is the uh, structure of migration and how it corresponds with the needs of Russian labor market? Um, and uh, uh, we have a separate uh, migration channel for highly qualified specialists because uh, it is uh, at the state level, uh, it's officially uh, said that we need and we are very much interested in highly qualified specialists and there was a special program introduced for highly qualified specialists by the uh, by, but uh, um, during the period 2011-2016 only 105 Thousands of work permits were issued for highly qualified specialists, so it's about uh, 20,000 per year. So this is not enough for the, for the uh, taking into account the demand of Russian labor market. So the reason is uh, the reason seems to be the poor attractiveness of Russia's proposed conditions of living and uh, high bureaucracy during issues uh, during um, uh, receiving the permissions and uh, the whole process of being in Russia. So, uh, speaking about the main problems uh, of Russia's migration strategy, uh, we have to take into account that Russia has never managed to arrive at the conclusion based on adequate <coughs> assessment of how many migrants it needs. And this is the main reason of all our problems, because uh, we have uh, no uh, adequate methodology of the assessment of our labor market demand. Uh, and this has resulted in inconsistent administrative decisions when uh, we uh, introduce a liberal migration policy and afterwards some restrictive administrative decisions. Uh, so uh, another important problem is real lack of official labor migrant infrastructure. Uh, it means that uh, the lack of consultancy and information services that will help uh, employees and employers to find each other 
and uh, uh, to um, the um, this process is largely spontaneous at the moment with a, um, a huge role of uh, shadow groups based <coughs> on ethnical principle playing a role of official uh, efficient employment mediators for employers and employees. Uh, another problem is the lack of understanding of real scale and structure of migrant inflows and of role that migrants play in the country economy. We have no methodology of uh, assessment of migrants, who, uh, of their competences, of their skills, of their qualifications uh, when they come to Russia. As a result, uh, despite the uh, high demand of um, qualified uh, labor, of, uh, in, uh, of foreign labor, uh, the, um, this, this demand of, often remains unclaimed. Uh, and uh, um, those migrants who come to Russia, they often, uh, they do very um, uh, not qualified uh, job instead of using their qualifications and their skills that they uh, that they uh, acquired in, in their countries of origin. Uh, so, um, uh, just this one. Um, a very important problem for Russia is uh, disregard for the need to have migrants to adapt and to integrate into the new society. So, uh, in Russian perception of integration, I would say, is oversimplified because uh, this process is going. Uh, in a spontaneous manner and there are no special pro pro programs that will help to adapt and to integrate migrants. Uh, from uh, 2004 till 2016 we had uh, a separate uh, state board, the Federal Migration Services, and there was a Department of Integration inside this body and they somehow tried to implement these programs of integration uh, and uh, they just did something in this field. But since 2016, when the, uh, all the uh, migration issues were transferred to the Ministry of Internal, uh, the process of securitization of migration started and, uh, of course, the Ministry of, uh, uh, of Internal is not the, uh, that state body that, can, uh, that could implement any adaptation or integration strategies. Uh, so, uh, the scale of illegal migration and unregistered migrant uh, employment is declining at the moment is in Russia. Uh, it was in the beginning of 2010, it was something about 5 million uh, illegal migrants in Russia. At the moment, it, it, it reduced to 2.5-3 million uh, migrants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anti-migrant uh, anti sentiments in Russian society are also reducing at the moment, uh, it, uh, starting from um, 81% in 2013 uh, to 54% uh, in 2017, but uh, this is uh, still rather high. Um, and we have uh, actually polarized society having different views uh, as to whether Russia should attract migrants in order to fulfill its demographic um, and uh, economic problems or to ban the number of uh, incoming migrants. Uh, of course, uh, the important factor here is uh, so-called securitization of migration uh, that is a tendency um, very uh, much supported by Russian media. Uh, during previous years, um, as Russia's media show, uh, natives of Central Asia uh, were involved in virtually every underground terrorist cell, uh, every terrorist attack uh, stage of prevented in the country over the past few years. So if we had in the 90s and in the beginning of 2000, we had so-called uh, uh, Caucasus net print, for footprint in uh, in uh, all our terrorist attacks and uh, terrorist cells. Uh, nowadays, we have Central Asian footprint in this uh, in these uh, issues, and of course, uh, of course, this leads to um, securitization of migration. First of all, in the conscious of Russian society. Uh, so, uh, coming to asylum seekers in Russia. Um, <coughs> 
you may have known that uh, they are not welcomed in Russia at all. Uh, and despite we have the influx of uh, refugees from Ukraine, uh, only um, the 292 migrants from Ukraine receive the status of official uh, refugees in Russia. So the numbers are really very ridiculous. And we have only two Syrian citizens as uh, with official status of refugees in Russian Federation. So uh, the uh, status of asylum seekers really doesn't work in Russia. Uh, the position of Russian authorities is to uh, to stimulate people uh, to acquire another statuses and uh, more, um, I would say, more um, um, uh, more uh, uh, the statuses that will give the people possibility to uh, uh, to present themselves as a kind of economic migrants or uh, residents uh, or to receive residence permissions, but some uh, long-term decisions, I would say, they uh, they are not welcome uh, these temporary asylum seekers or refugees uh, in Russia. And uh, but still, we have at the moment we still have uh, five, just five hundred eighty-nine official refugees in Russian Federation. Uh, so, despite the Geneva Convention, convention in these terms. Uh, Russia is not uh, in the uh, list of the countries who is welcome to, uh, to, to asylum seekers. So uh, that's uh, the main list uh, of issues that I wanted to, to tell you about Russian migration situation. And uh, of course, I'm happy to answer the questions in the answer. Now I would like to introduce you to my friend and colleague, um, Tara Hopkins, who has been working, um, she'll tell you more in detail, but at the Turkish-Syrian border with refugees and, and different kinds of, with different kinds of programs, um, I think she'll probably discuss the, you know, some of the best practices that have um, come out, but also the problems and the challenges that she's had working at the border and the changes that she's seen as the regime in Turkey has become, let's say, a bit more assertive. Yeah. So, Tara, please. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. And I'd like to thank everybody who shared what I found hope and inspiration last night. So that was a very, personally for me, that was a very good welcome for this. Um, yeah, I have an awful lot to say, and I had a, I have a PowerPoint prepared, but because I'm on a Mac, um, I was not able to get it up here, so I get the benefit to reread my own PowerPoint to you, just hopefully give you an idea of what it's about, and try to tap on to some of the other very important, yet for my own reality, very different aspects from some of the other speakers. Um, I start that because, because I come from the West, uh, I myself am not considered a migrant. I've been living in Turkey for longer than many of you have been alive. I've been in Turkey since 1989. And I'm either a foreigner, a Western living, Westerner living in Turkey, or I'm known as an expat. But nobody has ever referred to me as a migrant. Just to start with that. Um, I've been on the ground in civil society in Turkey for 20 years, and I happen to live right across from the Greek island of Lesbos, uh, which is the number one entry point um, for most migrants, usually from Syria, but not only from Syria. Um, I got tired. One of my friends has been working at one of the camps there since the crisis got so bad. And I think it was after the third phone call that she, she the third time that she contacted me for help to get corpses back to Syria, that I said, I want to be on the ground to do something to give people a reason not to get on the boats to risk their lives to go to Europe. So as Jody said, I was on the, the, the Turkish-Syrian border, <coughs> excuse me, as field manager for a Turkish organization. I was there in Tur until the Turkish state closed us down. And then I was in Istanbul working as general manager for a uh, also Turkish organization, but far and run, running the, the women's craft collective there. So I have some really fun photos, but I'm um, just some background information. 
Turkey does not accept, Turkey does not acknowledge refugees unless they come from Europe. This is from a 1951 convention based on aftermath of World War II. So right now, with the nearly 5 million quote-unquote refugees that we have in Turkey, the only ones who are considered refugees are those who have UNHCR status, and they are mostly from Afghanistan and Iran, uh, Iraq. None of the Syrians have refugee status in Turkey, and we have over 3.5 million uh, uh, people under temporary protection, which is what the Turkish state calls them. So, yeah, we have five, five, million, 5 million refugees, I will call them refugees, just for reference. Uh, in Turkey, 3.5 from, from Syria, the rest are from Iraq and Afghanistan. Turkey has been overwhelmed by the influx of people. Uh, I find it fascinating, the previous discourse, and I think there's a lot to be said for long-term planning and acknowledging that there are realities of a country that people are moving into, but at the end of the day, we're talking about people. People who have dreams, people who have hopes, people who are fleeing atrocities that you don't want to know about. You cannot believe that people can actually inflict such terrible realities onto another person. Um, people who are literally fleeing for their lives. Uh, so Turkey was caught unprepared for this insane influx of people. They had to set up a directorate for uh, migration management, which meant new buildings, which meant new employees, which meant a strategy. Because Turkey had no strategy for all these people. Where are they going to live? How are they, how are they going to live? Uh, we also have, as Jody mentioned, um, we have some political challenges within the country. We are <coughs> under a more and more autocratic regime. And when the migration uh, flow was so high, uh, do you remember the photo of the little boy, Alan Kurdi, who was washed up on the shore like he was sleeping? Um, I'm sorry to say, but that little boy's mission <coughs> was to change the, the policy because it was after that photo went viral that the UNHCR came in in mass, that all the other uh, international organizations came in mass in Turkey and on the Greek islands. Um, but somehow people forgot to talk to the Turkish government to how to implement what. You have all these children, how are they going to get to school? All these people who need to get either fed or housed or have a job. And there is very little dialogue with the Turkish government, which initially was not an issue because the Turkish government was pretty sure that they would be instrumental in not necessarily stopping the war, um, but in terms of getting Assad out. Well, as we see now in your aid of the war, that really didn't happen. Um, and when <coughs> Turkey realized that these people were here to stay and that the war was not going to end and that Turkey could not be instrumental in it, every, all the dialogue changed. So it used to be that you could have Syrian-run schools for Syrian children. The government put a stop to that. So all of a sudden you have all these children uh, <coughs> who have no access to school because Turkey doesn't have the capacity to give enough schooling to their own children. So what do you do? And of course these children don't have the same language. Um, how are they going to get to the school? It's not enough just to have a school and say the children need to go. They have to have access to get to the schools. Um, Turkey's also been under the state of emergency since the summer of 2015. Um, it's renewed every three months. Maybe it will be lifted, maybe not. Turkey also has, we also have an IDP reality. Um, IDP, everybody's familiar with that? Uh, it, internally displaced person, yeah. We don't discuss that. Um, we don't, yeah, we don't think the tenants aren't there. Uh, let's see. In, yeah, so this little boy, Alain Kurdi, washed up in September of 2015, and by the end of October 15, there was a stop. There was a total stop to migration. This is when Frontex was started. Frontex are the boats, the European supported, EU supported boats that are stopping the, the smuggled boats from coming into European waters. <coughs> NATO stepped up, the Turkish Coast Guard stepped up, of course the uh, Greek Coast Guard stepped up. Up until that point, any of us could help any refugees. In my own business, we had uh, basically from, from here to that wall, two shelves full of clothing, food, water, diapers, hygiene supplies. The police would give us a call when they found a group of uh, refugees trying to go to Europe, 
and the people either had to stop because there was a change, the smuggler changed something, or anyhow, they were stuck in I the town where I live in Ivan for a bit longer than they thought. The police would call us up, they said, we have 50 people, we've got 10 children, can you be ready? And they would allow us to actually support these people. Well, at the end of October uh, 2015, all of that stopped. Nobody could do anything um, to support anybody who was there. So, as you know, uh, the European countries don't really want this influx of people. So they are offering some money to try to support uh, reality for people living in Turkey. And it's a six billion euro project. To date, Turkey has spent, of the Turkish budget, budget since, not, since 2011, has spent 20 billion uh, dollars, which is not, it's, I guess that's what, 17, 18 uh, euros. Um, the deal, of course, is that Turkey, because they know they have a power, uh, they want to have visa-free travel, they want to have a lot of other uh, perks that the EU is not willing to provide. Um, and within the Turkish context right now, we have our own political issues, we have our own rights issues, we have our own issues with the minorities that, of course, we don't acknowledge as minorities, and the EU is saying, that's not cool, and Turkey says, well, we can just open the borders, can't we? Um, so right now, uh, the EU is only given 3 billion euros, and they're still discussing for the next 3 billion. We just had elections last week, so everything has been on hold because of that. Uh, going back to status, I want to go on something that was said earlier. By law, in the United States and European Union countries, and I'm not sure other countries around the world, if you step foot on that soil, you are entitled to apply for asylum. It doesn't mean you're automatically granted it. But by law, you are allowed to apply for asylum. Huge problem, of course, for the Greek islands is they don't have the capacity to process all these people coming in. Turkey doesn't deal with this, so uh, it's really not our problem because we just pretend that it's not an issue. Uh, going back to the Turkish perspective, we only have 10% of people living in camps, um, and they're mostly near the near the Syrian border. We have a wall. I think now there are. I was reading someone the other day. I think there are now 70 walls that have been constructed around the world to keep people out. We have a 781 kilometer uh, wall on the Syrian border. Any idea who paid for that? EU. Thank you. EU paid for it. Yeah. Um, Work on the ground has been really difficult to keep up with because the Turkish government keeps changing regulations. Uh, as an NGO, civil society organization, you used to be able to offer Turkish classes. What a great idea because immigrants need to know the local language. They're not going home anytime soon. Any idea how long a refugee tends to stay away from home? How many years? What? Tens of years, yeah. It's between 17 and 25 years uh, on average. This is not a new stat. This is an old statistic. Um, that refugees don't tend to go home anytime soon. What are they going to go home to? Why have they fled to begin with? I'm not talking about migrants. I'm talking about people who are fleeing war or persecution. Um, yeah. Uh, no, so the, okay, so it used to be as an NGO you could offer Turkish classes, English classes, computer classes, Arabic classes. You have children who have never been in school because the wars are going on for now eight years. Uh, the Turkish government put a stop to that. You have to have permission from the State Ministry of Education in order to be, in order to be able to give classes of any sort. Uh, and it's not as though the Turkish government has the capacity to meet all the demands. Uh, less than 0.1% of Syrians have been granted work permits in Turkey. There's a Turkish law that says for any uh, place of employment, you can only have 10% foreigners. <coughs> so only 21,000 out of the 3.5 million people, okay, let's say 1 million are children, so let's say 2.5 million people have permits. About half the refugee children are in school. Uh, there's a 50% dropout when you get to secondary school, and there's only 20% continuation into high school. We've had a problem with child laborers for many years in Turkey, with various attempts to put a stop to that. Uh, there are about 2 million child laborers in the country right now. Almost half of those are refugee children. This is all really negative stuff. Jody had asked me specifically to talk about some best practices, and a lot of my own frustrations, it was very difficult, but it was a very, very fun uh, exercise to do, so thank you for that. 
There are Syrian, Turkish, and international initiatives. There are initiatives from the Turkish state, and of course there are initiatives under UNHCR. Um, the Turkish Red Crescent, which is kind of the equivalent of the Red Cross, has stepped up and they are working very closely with uh, UNHCR, the EU, to provide what is known as the ESSN card, that's an emergency social service network. This is where money comes from, this is where part of the 3 billion euros comes from to pay for people's either rent or their food or whatever other uh, expenses they may have. UNICEF is working a lot. UNICEF, took, well, UNICEF was kicked out of Turkey before the crisis. Um, so they were allowed back in, and it took quite a while, but they were uh, working very closely with the, the Turkish government. There's some fantastic uh, people from UNICEF right now. There is a fellow, there's a Yemenese fellow here, I think, was here last night. Anyhow, it's a fantastic guy from Yemen who worked with UNICEF. Um, a lot of the support actually is coming from abroad. A lot of the best initiatives are coming from abroad. Uh, there's a great initiative under, are you familiar with Ashoka? Do you know Ashoka? Yes? Okay. Uh, Ashoka? Yesterday we had presentation here. Yeah. Okay, really quickly, what's Ashoka? <laughs> that good of a presentation, huh? A global network that promotes uh, social entrepreneurship. Fantastic. Okay, so there's a, a fellow from the U.S. actually, who's part of Ashoka Youth Venture, who has set up a fantastic initiative called Me, We, Syria, and he works with youth in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, and he's working on dialogue and storytelling as a way to deal with trauma, because very few people are dealing with trauma. He's working only with the youth. He works with multipliers. Um, there is an organization that is actually set up by a friend of mine to support children in school. Um, my photos. Anyhow, there are about 70,000, uh, 700,000 refugee children out of school in Turkey right now. So how do you decide who's going to go to school? This child is working. His father is either in prison or he's been killed. He's here with maybe his mother, maybe with his uncle. There's no money coming in. The child has to work. You cannot support this child unless you can say, we will give you enough money so that you will stay, go, in, go to school and stay in school and stop working. So there's a very strict vetting uh, process that goes through the state, to local uh, civil society organizations and local contacts. You have to pay for either the transportation, theoretically education in Turkey is free, but in reality it's not. You have to pay for books, you have to, because there isn't enough money in the coffers, have to pay to help paint the buildings, all this. There's always extra uh, expenses for education. Mm -hmm. This program is so comprehensive though, there are visits uh, every year to the children and the family and the school. It's a very labor intensive initiative, but it's a very effective initiative. We have three students now who are at university because of this. Other students were staying in school because of this. Uh, the child is contacted every month. Um, one of my favorite initiatives actually is not in Turkey, but I can also <coughs> see it from my house. It's from the Camp Pikpa. Has anybody heard of the Camp Pikpa on the island of Lesbos? Um, there are a number of camps that were set up by the UNHCR. Uh, on the Greek island of Lesbos, but PICPA was the first camp that was set up, and it's a camp of solidarity. And anybody familiar with the Greek context know that Greece is a bit of a mess right now, and they have a slight economic crisis. Uh, despite this, local people got together, they found an empty uh, state-owned residency, some, summer, uh, summer camp, that was, of course, not being used in the winter, asked for permission to use this, and initially the government said, yeah, sure, you can use it, thinking that nobody thought the price, the prices would last this long, thinking it'd just be for a few months, okay, gotta do something, we can't handle it, so you can deal with it. Um, people got together, and so you're providing some food, you're providing some clothing, you're, you're giving some time to play with the children, uh, and it's one of the best initiatives that has continued to date with zero money from the EU. Um, they make these bags. What's this bag made of? Yeah. The inflatable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The inflatable life jackets. Life jackets. Yeah, the, the ridiculous life jackets that are often death jackets. But yeah, yeah. it's a it's a mixed thing to work with this material because on one hand this has been instrumental to your escape. On the other hand, some of them are so poorly made that some people die because of them. But it's also a really horrible thing to have to get. Have you seen photos? Have you seen footage of those boats going across the sea? 
I'm not being funny. Can you imagine being in one of those? Can you imagine putting your mother who's in a wheelchair in one of those? Can you imagine putting your children in one of those? And the boats tend to be for, let's say, 30 people. They are almost always double. You almost always have to leave all of your possessions behind. I'm not being funny. I don't think any of us have the capacity, unless you've lived through it, to really understand what that does to one's psyche. Um, so, yeah, my personal feeling is that we need to go back. I understand that we need to focus on the realities you have. I, I found it fascinating the, the concept of having a quota. Um, as Elena was saying, a quota for the number of refugees that are, that are needed. I find it fascinating. We were talking earlier about the an excellent initiatives to work with agriculture in abandoned areas. And these processes are definitely needed. These policies are definitely needed. But at the end of the day, we need to go back to the concept of humanity. These are other people. And I think this is why, for me personally, last, last night was such a fantastic welcome because I felt so much hope and inspiration and a belief from the younger people that there is, it is possible to go back to focus on humanity. And that the, the adage, another world is possible, but only if the people want it and work for it. So I think all of us who are by an accident of birth able to be here and have not had to flee atrocities, um, I personally think we all have a responsibility to do something to promote, actively promote the idea of uh, humanity. So thank you very much and thank you. Thank you, Tara. Now, Kobe, I since you had given something of a presentation um, last week while you were here, you are free to really comment on what you would like. Okay? Maybe the execution. The what? execution. Yeah, I will mention that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me again, in spite of my last performance. <laughs> what do you mean, in spite of? I was <laughs> no, um, I'm, I'm very glad. Also, I was present last night, and I thought it was it was wonderful. And also, most of the things that have been said here, I, I agree uh, almost totally. My experience, I come from, from diplomacy, but I'm di uh, retired, and I'm certainly not speaking in any official capacity. I am speaking only for myself. I was an Austrian diplomat in a number of uh, places around the world. Um, I want to say that Austria has, of course, a long uh, tradition of migration, both of immigration and emigration, uh, dating back to the age of the uh, famous um, Austro-Hungarian monarchy. At, uh, and within about 80 or 90 years in the 19th, uh, early 20th century, 80, 80, 80 million people <coughs> emigrated from this area, from Austro-Hungarian monarchy within eight or nine decades, mostly to the United States of America. And the largest uh, city of uh, uh, where Burgenländer, Burgenland is the province next to, next to, used to be part of Hungary, <coughs> next to, uh, to this uh, part uh, of Europe, Burgenland, a very impoverished region always it has been. The largest cities of Burgenland uh, is Chicago. <laughs> and uh, well, you know, to tell you that we have also, the Austrians, always profited from migration, both uh, sort of getting rid of people, surplus people, exporting talents to the world, and uh, taking in people uh, at the time in the last uh, decade, centuries, mostly from uh, countries, of course, around what is uh, present-day Austria. Uh, Vienna, particularly, was a focal point of talents moving, ambitious people moving uh, to Vienna and, and uh, enriching both culturally, economically, and politically uh, what is uh, today Austria. But the problem is that most Austrians are unaware, uh, even though they have names which are clearly indicate that their grandparents, uh, at least, or their parents even, come from other parts of uh, this region, they, uh, they consider themselves as Germans or whatever, and are clearly xenophobic, and, and racist. Not all, of course, but there is a strong tendency, now translated in the political reality of the new government, 
So there is a lack of awareness, of consciousness, of our own origins, which are, most of us, are so-called migratory origins. Um, and uh, I think this is uh, rather deplorable. There have always been problems with migration, naturally, you know, and, uh, but also, also um, the, it has been an enormous advantage for, for Austria <coughs> to this day. They've been profiting from the, from the end of the Cold War, from the opening of the Iron Curtain. And yes, there, there are people coming over from Slovenia and from Hungary to work. And yes, there is uh, resistance and saying, you know, taking away the butter from our bread and so forth and counter reactions. But uh, <coughs> taking it all in all, it is a huge advantage for Austria. But it is not politically, uh, there's, there's little political or, or social awareness of these, of these advantages. And I come to that uh, later on because there, get the reasons for this kind of um, fear and rejection. As far as um, I am personally involved in uh, what you could call um, integration efforts on, on the Austrian side, there is a, a large a number of um, people in the so-called civil society who are um, involved in trying to assist uh, integration, assist uh, refugees and migrants and uh, by doing voluntary work of all sorts and I'm also uh, being uh, trying to be part of it. I offer lodging, I, um, I, take, I give uh, lessons, German lessons, I accompany refugees, asylum seekers to authorities and I have my experiences with this uh, Austrian system which does exist unlike we heard some other countries. There is a system a legal basis and, and some experience being built up in uh, integration, but it is far from uh, far from functioning well. Uh, there is especially there are German language courses and this and that, but there is especially a lack of um, focused um, integration into the labor market. And um, I don't want to elaborate on this, but this is my experience, and I wonder. Um, slowly improving, but, but by far not uh, fast enough. Why am I doing this? I asked myself and others have asked me. Why am I trying to, to help foreigners who come from whatever country that, so to speak, have a none of our business, as some people might say. I have always lived, most of my adult life, I have lived as a foreigner abroad. In a privileged position, yes, I was a diplomat. I was not a refugee. I was a diplomat. I had no worries of existence. But I had this experience of being welcomed by the natives, so to speak. When I go to a country, even if I speak the language, like I was posted in Berlin, uh, even if I know the language, it, is an, it makes an enormous difference uh, as a human being if you at least have a few people around you from the natives who try to uh, advise you, who take you by the hand, lead you to this and that, tell you what to do, tell you what not to do in their culture, and maybe helping to, you to learn the language and other things. That is, that is one of the main reasons. And I had the good fortune to grow up and to live, uh, to grow up in Austria and to be based in Austria, which is a country which had enormous um, fortune after the Second World War, unlike others who ended up on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And uh, we had, had much more uh, better opportunities to develop in every sense, economically, politically, and so forth than others. And I'm fully aware of this advantage, personal and also of um, the people of my country having, such, uh, having had such good fortune, which others didn't have. Uh, not, not to talk about other parts of the world, but just even in our immediate neighborhood. Now, I wondered, also, uh, after what has been said here, why is there such a fuss about uh, migration nowadays? Because we heard it is actually declining. It is declining to a level it hasn't been at for the last 10, 15, 20 years. And uh, also we have heard that um, that uh, most, and I, I know this myself, that most of the Austrians, for instance, have never met a real life refugee. They, uh, they, they hear about all sorts of things from the media and from their politicians, 
And so they, they are fearful and resentful, uh, and, uh, but most of them have never, have never seen a, a refugee, maybe seen, but never had anything to do uh, with such a person. So uh, what are the reasons, both of the underlying, one might ask, the, the, the surge of migration in especially the year 2015? Um, and uh, even though the numbers are much lower now, this issue is uh, to stay with us, the migration or refugees or whatever, from uh, countries in Africa and, and the Middle East and other areas of the world. Where is, why is it, uh, why is, uh, why is it? Um, and uh, has it nothing to do with us? Has it nothing to do with the politics that our countries are uh, sort of conducting? And uh, having lived uh, as part of my, uh, my professional life in North Africa, specifically in Tunisia, which is one of the best countries to this day, uh, we have heard about it uh, yesterday in this very moving presentation. Uh, you know, the, the Europe does, the European Union and the European countries do have something to do with the problems in the rest of the world. It's not that, you know, we are not the only ones responsible for the misery, but we are co-responsible for the misery of, of large parts of the world in terms of uh, our politics of, for instance, supporting, supporting dictators in, uh, in, in other parts of the world uh, for economic, so-called economic reasons, exporting arms, exporting poisonous garbage, uh, land grabbing, all sorts of things which are destroy destroying the basis of life for large numbers of uh, populations in other parts of the world. So one might think about what can be done uh, in, in terms of uh, European Union politics to improve, uh, to make the life bearable for, uh, for other people in other parts of the world. What are the, uh, what are, what is lying behind this kind of, um, this kind of politics? In my view, or one might ask, I don't want to impose this on you, I think it has something to do with the way, the way globalization has worked in the recent 20, 25, 30 years. The way it has worked, because globalization is not a natural process, it is the way, it is a political decision how to operate globalization, which I think has caused a lot of the problems, deregulation, privatization, and so forth. And the countries of Central and Eastern Europe have been exposed to this kind of uh, neoliberal ideology in an extreme, uh, often an extreme manner. And I think what you see now, especially in these countries of Eastern and Central Europe, is a backlash against this kind of transformation that they have been exposed to, uh, without wishing to excuse all sorts of xenophobic <coughs> and other, um, uh, and other uh, symptoms. So uh, some people call this undemocratic liberalism as opposed to the other term which we have heard. And uh, this brings me next to the failure also of the European Union, which is, uh, my view, could be more social, to put it mildly. It is mostly an organization uh, <coughs> profiting uh, uh, certain parts of populations, the gaps between rich and poor, are uh, as a consequence of this kind of globalization are also growing within Europe and are uh, aggravating the, the mood and the resentment of especially the middle classes uh, which uh, are, are either losing or are afraid of, of losing their standing. And uh, making migrants, whether refugees or economic migrants which are now labeled illegal, making them responsible for um, other ailments and other issues which should be tackled but are much more difficult to address. This typical scapegoating should end as soon as possible. It's not in our interest. Thank you.